I was born into one of the leading families of the American white nationalist movement. I spent my teenage years running white nationalist radio and media, winning a local Republican election, appearing in interviews and organizing activist training seminars. And then in 2013, I publicly condemned the movement after years attending public liberal arts college where I experienced condemnation, open dinner, protest, and confrontation. I've spoken against white supremacy in the years since. The year that I was born, 1989, was also the year that my godfather David Duke won his race for Louisiana State Legislature as a Republican despite having led the Ku Klux Klan just a decade prior and continuing to espouse white supremacist positions. My dad, Don Black, was managing the campaign's digital operations and was working to support his friend of many decades. In that campaign, they had received formal condemnations from Ronald Reagan, from then-President George H.W. Bush, and from the Republican Party Chairman Lee Atwater. The next year, David ran for U.S. Senate unsuccessfully. The year after that, he ran for Louisiana governor, but he also lost. In those campaigns, however, he won 55 and 60 percent respectively of the white vote statewide. He never used racial epithets. He campaigned against higher taxes, against big government, against free trade, because he said it hurt workers and he advocated sending troops to patrol the border with Mexico. In 2008, when I was 19, I filed my paperwork for a spot on the local ballot to fill an executive committee seat for the Palm Beach County Republican Party. I was careful not to talk too explicitly about race, but I spent time talking to my Republican neighbors about how social programs took too much of their taxes and gave it to people who weren't like them. I talked about how Hispanic immigration was overwhelming their city. I suggested that there were parts of town that had more gun crime, not because of poverty or segregation, but because of the culture of those people who live there. I won that small race with over 60% of the vote. Once my background became widely known, it escalated into a national scandal. The party leaders condemned me and ultimately had me unseated. David Duke came to town to defend me. I received death threats, but also local praise by people I met whenever I was out. There was a period where I couldn't pay for my order at Dunkin' Donuts because somebody in line would inevitably take the charge and tell me to keep up the good work. That's the context in which I spent my childhood until college. After I matriculated at a small Florida liberal arts college in 2010, I knew it was only a matter of time before the world of that social justice community and my activism collided. Ultimately, over years, the college community compelled me to change my worldview. Widespread campus condemnation led me to accept an invitation to weekly Shabbat dinners organized by an observant Jewish student. One of his sweet mates in the dorms, Allison Gornick, initially stopped attending those dinners whenever I showed up, but the college was a small place and we eventually got to know each other. Over the next two years, Allison and I started to talk privately about what I believed and why and I listened when she came back with better research. In full disclosure, all these years later, Allison is now my wife. I don't have the years in college those conversations took me, but in brief, the arguments and counter arguments were these. I eventually had to accept that there is robust research demonstrating that access to resources and education predict crime rates, not race that the same IQ test cannot be universalized around the world as white nationalists try to claim, race itself cannot be biologically defined, and most of all, opportunities in our society are biased in favor of white people. In a study that's been replicated many times, identical resumes are much more likely to be given a call back when the applicant has a white name rather than a typically black one. A black child raised in a two-parent family in an upper-middle-class home is likely to end up with the same lifetime income as a white person raised in a single-parent home with half that income. African Americans charged with the same crime are given longer sentences than white people, even when the judge giving the sentence is made aware of this disparity and asked to avoid it. And yet millions of white Americans, when polled, will say that discrimination in America is now greater against white people. I'm honored to participate in the Convention on Founding Principles. It's not often that I'm asked to speak as a former Republican rather than a former white nationalist. And I wanna make it clear, I don't think Donald Trump is a white nationalist. 
The president is not a follower of the white nationalist movement, but rather he uses the same fear and beliefs that they are both trying to stoke. Neither white liberalism nor white conservatism is intrinsically anti-racist. Partisans at both ends of the political spectrum have tried to benefit from white fear of non-white people and have promoted racism. But let's be clear, it is the Republican Party that has become the home and mainstream advocate of white identity politics. Long before Trump, white nationalists saw this. Throughout the decades since the Civil Rights Acts of the 1960s, segregationists and anti-immigrant activists moved to the Republican Party and fought out their ideological battles in its halls. Republican elites used this momentum as a political tool. Richard Nixon's strategy to win the South relied on appeals to whites who opposed integration and opposed anti-racist social programs. Nixon ran to victory on white backlash to civil rights, and so did Reagan, who announced his 1980 campaign at the Neshoba County Fair in Mississippi, promising to fight for states' rights, the longtime cry of segregationists. And yet, not even advocates in the white nationalist movement expected such a full and swift retreat of the pro-immigrant ideological wing of the Republican Party or of the conservatives who denounced racial discrimination. I now regularly watch political speeches by elected politicians that advocate extreme immigration restriction. I see the president's preference for European immigrants and lawmakers and the courts calling to abolish affirmative action and voting rights. This all mirrors the white nationalist positions that I always thought would be more difficult to gain widespread acceptance. I can't offer a clear way out other than to say that the racist demagoguery that has come to dominate the Republican Party is not the only thing it ever was. Anti-racism means fighting against systems that disadvantage one group because of our biases, self-protection, our historical advantages, or our fear. If you believe that a dynamic economy is one where no one's identity and culture should prevent them from work, homeownership, wealth accrual, or freedom of participation and speech, then you have committed yourself to fighting white supremacy and racism. I'm open to hearing conservative answers to the cancer of racism in some future election, but to be honest, this year I hope you're voting for Joe Biden. His policy proposals, providing $50 billion in public-private venture capital to entrepreneurs of color and $100 billion in low-interest business loans should appeal to people from all across the spectrum. And your alternative is another term of the most explicitly white supremacist administration in recent history. As we all move through the world, we will encounter people who believe in white nationalism in one form or another. We can choose which path to take, engaging in logical arguments, especially if we're white and we feel safe doing so, or protesting the larger system of white supremacy. But what we can't do is nothing. Silence is the only wrong choice. Thank you.